It was a cold night in a rough part of Newcastle, and a young black man is pumping gas into a sedan. Across the road, three young boys, three young white boys, no older than 16 years old, suddenly start to pay attention. Look at that nigger pumping gas, says one, loud enough to be heard. Nigger, what you doing here? Says another, provocatively. The black man pretends not to hear. Although he might be asking himself the same question. There are so many places he could be. Born in London. Raised in Trinidad. A graduate of Howard University in Washington, D.C. The boys refuse to be ignored. They cross the street marching towards the gas station. Their voices grow louder, their insults darker. As they draw closer, one boy's eyes widen and his tone changes dramatically. Hey, that Shaka is slap. <laughs> Shaka might be a black man, but more importantly, he's a Newcastle United player. And more than that, Newcastle just paid 1.75 million pounds for his services, which made him at the time the second most expensive goalkeeper in the history of the England Premier League. The city had big plans for this particular black man. Flipping hell. He's impressed, very impressed. The boys are running towards Shaka now, but they don't want trouble. They want his autograph. Shaka never gave those boys an autograph. <laughs> a few months later, he co-founded an anti-racism program called Show Racism the Red Card, which today operates in five countries across Europe educating young men and women, like those three boys. Boys who would abuse a minority on the street, yet applaud one who could catch a football in a stadium. Shaka knew it was insufficient to be revered as a footballer, yet despised as a human being. This is an example of how sport could be a positive catalyst for change within society. Sport matters. But why should sport hold this important position in the first place? Sport is first entertainment. It is a live play, totally ad-libbed by its actors who have no idea what ending awaits. One part ballet, one part martial arts, another part chess. By which I mean it is an elegant battle of wills and sustained aggression. High performance sport offers us the chance to see excellence in its most testing conditions. To see that thing you did as a child performed at such an unthinkable level that it crosses an invisible line and becomes more than the act itself. It becomes art. If a chef and myself diced a carrot in front of you right now, even a child could tell which one is the pro. If gymnast Simone Biles and myself skipped across the stage, only one of us would draw applause for doing so. <laughs> Sport offers us a chance to do extraordinary feats with our bodies. If we celebrate the academics among us, who use more of their brain than the average person, then why not cherish and celebrate athletes who, with a roll of the ankle, a swish of an arm, or a swerve of his torso, 
could make thousands leap off their seats, hug strangers, burst into dance with no music playing. <laughs> Michael Holden, the legendary West Indies fast bowler, could speak about the greater communal meaning of sport. Mikey was 22 years old when he taught England for the first time. And he wouldn't remember much about that first warm-up match, which they lost. But what he does remember is the reaction from those disappointed West Sydney supporters who surrounded the tour bus. These were Caribbean migrants trying to earn a living in the face of soul-crushing discrimination and often poor working conditions in England. And they weren't all cricket fans. But they knew what cricket meant to their British employers, neighbors, and friends. For them to be identified with a team possessing the personality, skill, and swagger of that West Indies side meant everything to their self-esteem. When at the workplace, conversation invariably turned to sport, they, through cricket, felt like the equals of their bosses, if only for a fleeting moment. The stakes for Mikey and company went well beyond the cricket boundary. This was no meaningless pastime to those migrants. Sport mattered because it made them matter. And that sense of community is felt by supporters of sport teams all over the world. And it's not just about the game, but the events surrounding it as well, the anticipation. Picture 90% of a train's fans getting up, getting off, not at the final stop, but at the train station within walking distance of a football ground on match day. Imagine being part of that army all wearing similar colors, all holding identical scarves, all singing the same war tune. United every week in a way most of us would never experience in a lifetime. I remember one incident in London. I just disembarked and I realized I'd lost my train ticket. So I went looking for a railway worker to explain the problem. And I just started talking when he opened the gate so I could pass, no fuss. Now, Brits aren't exactly famous for bending the rules, so I hesitated. And he pointed to the tip of my jersey, which was peeking out uh, just beneath my sweater and he gave me a sly wink. I was wearing a West Ham jersey. <laughs> Honestly, I wasn't a West Ham fan. <laughs> but to this day, I still have a soft spot for the hammers. Yeah. Thousands of miles from home, I'd, meet an, I'd been an ally through sport. Let me share with you a secret. Sport is a metaphor for life. It's about knowing when to look at the scoreboard and when not to. It's about knowing when to look for the performance or the final product. It's about respecting the process, even as it change the outcome. Right? Now, in sport, they could never get away from the final score because sport is about success and failure. It is about winners and losers. But if you get enough things right, and if you reduce the chance for error, you're already more than halfway there. Sport matters. 
Now, the power of sport isn't missed by those with darker agendas. German Chancellor Adolf Hitler tried to use the 1936 Berlin Olympics as a Nazi propaganda tool. In modern day Russia, we now have confirmation of widespread state sponsored doping. And this is a country stripped of 43 Olympic medals because of doping violations. Thousands of athletes, their health put at risk because of a dishonest, manipulative leader. Sometimes, fans are the pawns. Like when far-right groups seek out football grounds across Europe, filled with young, white, working-class males to recruit into their racist ideology. When an authoritarian state or a dodgy businessman buys a sporting team to soften his image, or sometimes you're trying to launder money as well as reputations, as was the case with fraudster Alan Stanford, who used T20 cricket as a US $7 billion Ponzi scheme. All using sport in the most vile way to suit their twisted agendas. There's always good old greed, too. Our own Jack Warner. A teacher with a technical vocational school who somehow amasses personal wealth valued at over US $200 million, despite administering in a sport that in Trinidad and Tobago is largely amateur, and a sport that only carries a stipend to administrators at international level. The 2004 visit to Trinidad of former South Africa president and Nobel Peace Prize winner Nelson Mandela gives some insight into how Jack leveraged the influence of his FIFA vice presidency post for personal benefit. At the time, South Africa were bidding to host the 2010 World Cup. Right? FIFA estimates that the World Cup is viewed by 3.6 billion people across the globe. And South Africa felt that was the perfect antidote for their poor global image and their struggling economy. The hitch, the problem, was that they had bid to host the World Cup in 2006 and lost by a single vote. And Jack, as CONCACAF president, claimed to have 35 votes that he could point in any direction he chose. All he wanted from South Africa was a visit from Mandela. Well, that and 10 million US that the FBI would like to ask him some questions about. <laughs> but that's another story. So, Madiba, against his doctor's advice, flew to Port of Spain in what would be his last official overseas trip. The final agenda item in Trinidad was a fundraiser at Warner's controversial center of excellence, where guests would charge a thousand a plate with proceeds promised to the Cyril Ross home for children with HIV AIDS. And the venue was packed. 15 years after that dinner, six years after Mandela's death, and the Cyril Ross home Still awaiting a check from the fundraiser graced by that great man. If we accept that sport does play an important role in society, how do we protect it from the chances who seek to exploit it? Now remember, top flight athletes could come as young as 12 years old. 
how do we look out for their health, for their welfare? What will you do to protect these athletes who give so much to us? One of my favorite examples of sport as an inspiring tool came at the Beijing Olympics 100 meter finals. Now everybody remembers Jamaica's Usain Bolt and his world record 9.69 second sprint that stunned track and field. But you know what I remember? I remember this skinny Trinidadian fella next to him, Richard Torpedo Thompson. The supposed no hoper. <laughs> because when Bolt took off and all around him, athletes lost their composure in the face of something they had never seen before. Thompson kept his head, measured his strides, worked harder than he had ever done before. And it was good enough for a silver medal in the fastest race of all time. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Consider the teachable moments in those 10 seconds. Imagine what we as a nation could accomplish if we inspired or encouraged our public servants to follow that example. On a Friday afternoon, <laughs> after lunch, <laughs> the things we learn about ourselves in the heat of battle on the sporting field, when our convictions, our morality, and self-esteem are tested. This is why sport matters. Sport offers a level playing field. Each participant starts at 0-0 zero, zero, with no inherent advantage. Each athlete equal in the eyes of his or her competitor in the face of the umpire. Equality that extends even to a young black man pumping gas in Newcastle. His brilliance in catching a football overshadowing a stereotype that claimed he was inferior. Now, if sport could help three misguided youth see beyond their own prejudices, imagine its potential for society as a whole. Consider the power of sport, the power of this platform, where young men and women could make millions sit up and pay attention through a raised fist, like 1968 Olympians, Tommy Smith, and John Carlos, or a lowered knee, like ex-NFL quarterback Colin Kaepernick. Doesn't sport matter? <laughs> <laughs>